we have heard already that the Hartford Small Business Success Study found that some small business owners are still feeling the effects. The title of today's event is Recession Reset. So Stephanie, can you put some color around these numbers? How are small businesses seeing the recession and are they out of it? Sure, Lindsay, thank you. Um, I think the themes that you heard Chris Wiff speak about as well as the governor, we're pacing in Connecticut pretty consistently with across the United States in terms of fiscal conservatism. In fact, about 55, 56% of Connecticut small business owners still are feeling the effects of the post-recession and how they are managing their, their money. But what I do find incredibly encouraging and what came out loudly in our survey was the following. Connecticut, very different than our national counterparts, we're feeling a bit bullish. We're feeling bullish about um, investing in our small businesses, the small business owners here in the state of Connecticut. They're also feeling as though not only are they feeling bullish about this, but they're committed to growing. And not only growing, they use the word growing significantly. So that was also encouraging. And then the other point that I would want to tease out that was different here in the state of Connecticut versus our national counterparts in terms of taking risk. And so we all know small business owners, you've got to take risks to make those investments pay off. And so very nicely, we saw some key differences in the state of Connecticut versus what we're seeing from our national counterparts. Great. So let's hear from two small business owners in Connecticut. Hartford Prince opened shortly after the recession. Rory and Kelly are here. Can you talk about the decision to open your business after the recession and how you're doing today? Sure. Um, well, we, um, the opening of Harper Prince is a d direct result of the Great Recession because our older sister, Addie, applied for a Greater Hartford Arts Council grant that came to the city via um, part of the Obama stimulus um, funding. That was for um, arts-specific businesses that were going to create jobs. So she received $75,000 um, in a grant and started employing local um, high school students as print apprenticeships in a letterpress studio. Um, and then <clears throat> when the uh, terms of the grant expired and the grant money ran out, um, you know, it was that sort of flat time after the recession 2012. Rory was freelancing. I was an elementary school teacher in New York. and. Addie <clears throat> had the whole infrastructure of this business ready to go. And so all three of us took pr a pretty significant leap forward <laughs> and um, started it as a commercial uh, endeavor. So from 2012 until today, we see the trends that you speak of. I mean, we've grown significantly in those two and a half years, um, and we're taking risks every day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can you show everyone your t-shirt? Ooh, <laughs> this is the skyline. <laughs> so I know we're a big group, but I want to invite all of you to join me to go shopping at Hartford Prince after this morning's event, because I want one of those uh, for sure. Um, thanks, Rory and Callie. So Paul, can you put this into a larger perspective? Have you been seeing a change in the small business landscape from the macro level? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make probably three different comments, because we serve entrepreneurs that employ five or less employees. And so what I'll first say is, in our universe, we're the canary in the, land, in the coal mine. When the recession, before the recession kicked in, we started to see our small businesses struggle almost a year in advance. We couldn't explain it. We didn't know what was happening. Then, of course, the economist said, oh, we're in a recession. We said, uh-huh. <laughs> um, but similarly, our clients also uh, were able to come out of that once you have stability. It's not that the economy was great, but remember, the, the issue is if you're not stepping on quicksand, you can start figuring out where you want to pace and where you want to go. Uh, I've always said you don't need growth, you need stability. Once you have that, we began to see uh, businesses uh, begin to succeed. So I would say for us, this has been happening for years and the fact that now it's reflected at a macro scale is kind of two or three years after the fact. And I think it's very similar to what you just heard here. <laughs> So that's point number one. Point number two is we talk a lot about growth. And one of the things that Axion has been looking to do, or we, we just finished, we, we actually did our own kind of study on uh, business owners. And what we find is, and it was mentioned earlier, we think there's four different kind of business owners, and I'm just gonna talk about two. 
One we call the lifestyle business owner, which I believe this survey just reflected, which is the motivation for starting the business was to create a lifestyle. And, and the reasons for that include everything from creative expression, because it's not happening maybe in the corporate environment, or they, people feel that the ceilings are holding them back in one way or another. Uh, two, flexibility. We find that owners, particularly parents, cannot have a schedule where you can be on call because it's Black Friday and we need you in at a certain hour, but you know, it doesn't really work with the family schedule. So people have chosen flexibility just for lifestyle. Um, and, and, and then of course, just to provide an income. But I wanna contrast that with another group that we call Launchpad. And Launchpad for us is a business owner that is here today, grounded in, in the reality of the world, but looking to get to the moon. And those business owners have, as intention, a path to go from here to there. And, and I don't know the mix, but I'm gonna hazard a guess based on the survey that 85 to 90% of businesses in this country are lifestyle, mm -hmm. and that 10% are, are Launchpad. And the reason why I was interested in listening to the comments of the governor is that uh, Launchpad businesses or anything that's high scale, high growth, uh, happen to have also some of the biggest impacts. And so it's interesting to me that, that the results are so favorable here in Connecticut, and to hear what's going on uh, that, 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 that are triggering those opportunities like the Pratt & Whitney, I think there's a linkage there, and I just would caution everyone that out of 10 entrepreneurs, don't expect all of them to grow because that's not why they, mm -hmm. they, they got there. The final thing I want to say to go down to the macro point, and this is maybe a little bit uh, on a sobering note, but what we see at a national scale uh, are at least three challenges that we face as a country. And I think as an entrepreneur, you're, you're having to deal with this. The first is real estate. Real estate is no longer going to be the wealth building tool it used to be a generation ago. The number two wealth building tool is small business formation. Mm -hmm. So I think as a country, when we realize that the home isn't gonna generate what it did for our parents, but having a business may need to be, I think it's gonna have implications for millennials in the future, may even have implications for us here in the group. So that's point number one. Point number two is there's a lot of talk about the jobs, and that's great, but we're in a low wage recovery. Um, someone um, had, had shared with me that something like 20 of the top 30 fastest growing jobs only require a high school diploma. That has implications for us. Why? Because if I'm a business owner, what I really care about is the money in my customers' pockets because without that money, they're not going to buy from me. I was on the... Um, uh, sharing a ride from a tow truck, because unfortunately getting up here was a little more challenging than I thought. And I asked the driver what's going on, and you know, he took me to the dealership, and we were talking about cars and repairs, and, and he made the comment, people don't have money. You know, you'll have to figure out whether that repair is worth it or whether you get a new car. But it was interesting to me that here's a guy in a truck, he's driving a lot of people, and his, his innate instinct is that people are really watching how they spend their money. And if you know that innately as a business owner, how much risk are you going to take? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, the second piece. And then the third, um, even though it's easier to access capital, I would say it's because business owners have a track record. Mm -hmm. You now have a few years of profitability. <coughs> but the macro picture actually is a little bit more uh, uh, daunting. Uh, what we see is that actually f uh, traditional banks are pulling away from small business lending. Small business lending is defined, depending on the market, anything from 250000 and less to some organizations, if, if you're not borrowing a million or two or less, you, you, you're considered a small business. And that's because the uh, regulatory environment, in part, the, the need to make sure that our banks are doing the right thing has created such a high cost and, and they're not able to innovate around that, that I think one of the things that we're seeing that we've never seen is perhaps a permanent withdrawal by financial institutions from a segment that we know is most vital. So um, I, I know that's a lot, but I wanted to paint a different picture than the one that I see from a, a nonprofit perspective, serving business owners, and what I hear from business owners, and we cannot ignore those uh, elephants in the room at a macro level because every business owner is having to make decisions every day on how to deal with it.